Hi, everyone. My name is Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa. I'm the editor of Orinoco Tribune. Uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy the work that we do. We are an imperialist uh, Chavista uh, outlet based in Caracas. And, and uh, we today have the pleasure of having the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, Omali Yeshitela. And also we have the, uh, as a guest, Joe Isobaker, which is an activist and a member of Freedom Road Socialist Organization uh, uh, that lives in Chicago. And we are gonna have an interview about uh, FBI raids, about FBI intimidation, about the US police state uh, repressing anti-imperialist, uh, progressive socialist, uh, black liberation, brown liberation movement in the US and its implications uh, in the international solidarity uh, movement that is so needed to try to build a better society overall. So before further ado, uh, and, and before jumping to the, to the questions, I'm gonna introduce uh, Omali Yeshitela. He's the chairman, as I already said, of the African People's Socialist Party and leader of the Uhuru Movement, a worldwide organization fighting for the self-determination of African people. He founded the Born in Spear newspaper, which has been in continuous publication since the 1960s. Since 1972, he has traveled the world and built branches and economic institutions in African communities to advance anti-colonial movement. He organized the first tribunal of rep on reparations for African people in 1982 in New York City, and then campaigns that made reparations the household word that it is today. Following the murder of Mike Brown in San Luis, the Huru movement Black Power Blueprint has transformed abandoned properties in the Black community to be like community center, basketball court, housing for the formerly incarcerated, a community garden, an outdoor events venue with a woman health center on the way. So they basically are uh, trying to uh, improve the very harsh conditions that black community have to uh, live in in the US because of the racist nature of the US government, the US system. So welcome again, Chairman. And Joe Isobaker is a district organizer in Chicago for Freedom Road Socialist Organization and a retired uh, rank and file trade unionist He's also co-chair of the Labor Committee for the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. And in 2010, his home was raided by the FBI. His ex-wife and him were subpoenaed to a federal grand jury investigating their movement for providing material support for foreign terrorist organizations in Palestine and Colombia. Again, we see uh, the same path you know, uh, you know the connection uh, 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 of you know attacking attacking uh, organizations, classroom organizations in the U.S. based uh, on their international solidarity uh, activities, and that's something that one has to pay attention to because that might be part of the also the attacks against you. So. Uh, that's what I wanted to stop before the questions to talk about that. International solidarity is important. And, and, and Chairman uh, Yeshitela was uh, uh, mentioning me a few minutes ago about a solidarity statement that he made uh, supporting the Venezuelan people and President Maduro in 2019 during a, a conference in, in Oxford, if I recall well. Uh, so, 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 and, and, and what happened uh, against our compass in, in, in Chicago in 2010 was the result of the solidarity that they had supporting Palestinians, uh, uh, supporting uh, Simon Trinidad, uh, a farmer guerrilla that has been incarcerated in the US for several years already. So, so, so this is something that, uh, that our compass, uh, not only in the US, but in the global north have to face it's a reality that you have to face, you know, uh, and and know that uh, that the, your the governments, the police state, uh, uh, are is going to use against you, and of, but of course that make more difficult 
the communication between you know you guys in the north and us in the south that are the the, the also the ones uh, uh, more affected by you know U.S. imperialism. So so that's the mention that I wanted to ma uh, to make about the international solidarity, and and now I wanna try to contextualize a little bit what happened uh, during the raids uh, against uh, the oh, uh, against Chairman Yeshitela and, and the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, and it's important to, to say that it happened on July 29, if I recall well, last year, yes, like four or five months after the beginning of the of the uh, military operation, Russian military operation in Ukraine. And 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 we were at that moment in the middle of the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, the Russophobia campaign campaign, the cancel Russia campaign and and. And it's important to say that because uh, the conditions, I believe, uh, at that moment might be different than the conditions right now when it's evident that more people are realizing the big mistake of blindly support uh, Zelensky, the U.S. government, and all the craziness that NATO is doing to basically impose their imperialist vision. Uh, of the world. So uh, I believe that it's important to contextualize that, uh, that those rates, uh, that rate, uh, uh, and also it's important uh, because in Venezuela, we are at this moment um, discussing a law to regulate the operations of uh, non-governmental organizations, of NGOs. And we are tr basically trying to do something that many countries already have, that the Nicaraguans did a few months ago, uh, which is basically regulate the money that, uh, especially the right-wing organizations, NGOs in Venezuela that has uh, that are a tool of U.S. imperialism, uh, uh, the money that they receive. And I'm saying this because uh, the U.S. government and mainstream media and all the tools that they use to, to, to impose the imperialist approach, they say that, that we are an authoritarian regime because we are trying to you know, pass this new law. And it's very contradictory uh, that they say this, and at the same time, they are attacking uh, the, the, the African People Socialist Party because their connections with Russia. Taking into consideration that since 1938 or 39, the US has the uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act, which is something very similar to the thing that we are trying to do here in Venezuela. So, so I believe that it's important to contextualize that because it shows you the, the contradictions and the, what is the word? Uh, Hypocrisia, the hypocrisy uh, uh, of the U.S. government of the system, you know, in relation to these issues, and of course, uh, these uh, events that happen against uh, uh, Uhuru uh, uh, and against uh, the Compass in the Midwest in 2010 is uh, an evidence of uh, how. Uh, complicated the life of grassroots organizations, anti-imperialist organizations, black, brown, liberation, activism uh, is uh, in the US uh, with an state that is basically a racist state that promotes Russophobia, Sinophobia, Islamophobia, any kinds of phobias. And, 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 and they have to live through that. And, and, and the idea of this event, this interview is also try to present you with, you know, lessons learning from 2010 and, and, and what might be done by class organizations in the U.S. to avoid uh, this, um, you know, uh, intimidation campaigns that are launched by the U.S. government from time to time. So, um, Basically, uh, what happened in 2010 is that uh, in the Midwest against uh, the compass that are very close to Joe Isobaker, is that uh, the FBI launched raids in September 2010 against uh, several uh, 
activists in the Midwest, in 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 in, in Minnesota, in uh, in in Illinois, in in Michigan. Uh, I believe that also in St. Louis there was. There, I'm not sure if, if I recall well, but I believe that there there was one person from St. Louis. You might correct me later, and Joe. But anyway, the important thing is that they were accused <coughs> of being promoters <coughs> of supporters of providing material support to to foreign terrorist organizations because they had international solidarity connections like any movement around the world has uh, with uh, with Palestinian liberation organizations with uh, uh, Simon Trinidad liberation organizations in Colombia uh, so so I mean uh, it, it's a complex situation and, and, and I had the, the honor to witness it uh, because I was living in the U.S. at that time, I was the Consul General of Venezuela in Chicago at that time, and I knew exactly what happened. Actually, the day the raid happened, we had an event organized in my residence, and uh, like half of the invitees did not attend because they were in the middle. I mean, the, the whole event was almost destroyed because half of, half of the MBTs were were uh, in the middle uh, or you know caught in the middle of these raids so i witnessed it firsthand and i know the impact it has on normal people you know and especially young people and i believe that it's important to highlight that because i really recall cases of young activists that join uh, you know the 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 Arab uh, Liberation Network the the, the the network that is led by by Hatan Abudeya, and uh, which was one of the most important target uh, during those raids, and 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 there were a lot of guys kids that were scared to death because the FBI the FBI knock at their doors, and, and I believe that it's important to highlight that because uh, not too many people talk about that and and the effect that that has on the movement also, and. And now, in in July 29 last year, the FBI did all something similar. I believe that more, more aggressive, more violent against Chairman Jesse Tella because they basically uh, uh, storm uh, your house if uh, uh, where you live with your wife, and and they use stone grenades. They basically uh, close the whole neighborhood. They brought uh, uh, tanks or, or you know, uh, armor vehicles into the area. They pointed you with those uh, laser target things, like if you were uh, Osama bin Laden. So, so it's crazy to see how uh, these events can happen in a country that calls itself the beacon of democracy and whatever uh, especially taking into consideration all the 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 things that that government has been doing against movements like co-interpro like the assassination of fred hampton and uh, 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 and, uh, and it's absolutely possible that they, they could have killed you during those raids so so it's absolutely uh disgusting and 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 i don't know what word to use but it's something terrible that shouldn't happen in a country that called itself a democracy. So without further ado, I will jump into the first question that is directed to Chairman Yeshitella. And he's basically asking you to update us about, you know, the details of the FBI rates that I have missed or that might have been missing by media, uh, but also update us about the status of this intimidation process against you, against the African People's Socialist Party, and against the Uhulu movement. Sorry for taking so long in the introduction. No, that's very good. I, I thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And uh, I really appreciate being able to be here to have this discussion with you um, and uh, with Comrade uh, Joe uh, Eichelbaker. Uh, I think it's uh, extremely important. I, I would like to, if I may, uh, just uh, start off by saying that, uh, that yes, we are socialists, but I wanna say more than that. 
because even if you look at the issues that you've elaborated on opening up this discussion, I want to say that uh, that America is a settler colony. Uh, uh, that it came and took this land and that the indigenous people here live in concentration camps that are euphemistically referred to as Indian reservations, those who survived the terror and the terror that they endure even up to this moment as we are having this discussion right now. <clears throat> and that African people, uh, in addition to the indigenous people, are the only people in this country who did not come here looking for a better way of life. We lost a better way of life as a consequence of being brought here at gunpoint, one. So that the history of our existence in this country has been a history of trying to change our relationship from a naked, uh, obvious kind of terror, uh, that, that, that the colonial terror uh, that we were brought here uh, with. We, that's been the whole history trying to end that, what you call it, slave rebellion, slave revolts, uh, demonstrations against oppression, exploitation, you know, 1950s, 1960s, assassination of Malcolm X and all people like this. All of this is part of a common trajectory of black people. This is pre-Putin. This is uh, pre-Lenin. This is pre-Soviet Union. This is a part of the history, one of this country, but it's also and from our perspective. Uh, the basis of the existing uh, uh, political and economic configuration of the world, which came about as a consequence of colonialism, which became a mode of production. And we look at it, Venezuela, what happens in Venezuela, we talk about Palestine, we talk about Cuba, we're talking about uh, uh, African people in this country, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, even when we look at Iran, all these other places that we're looking at, we're looking at uh, people who have been victimized by some iteration of colonial domination. And it's upon this foundation that the whole capitalist system that people say that they're fighting against rests. Like when Karl Marx said himself, uh, for those you know, who need this kind of reminder, uh, he characterized this as primitive accumulation. He said, turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. He says that this act of primitive accumulation uh, the capturing of countries and peoples and resources is what gave birth to the social system that he refers to as capitalism. He says it has the same significance in political economy as original sin in theology. This is where it all started. And so when we look at what is Venezuela today, which is a consequence in part of the invasion of those lands by Europeans who kill millions and millions of indigenous peoples, uh, et cetera, uh, we look at all of that area, you know, you're looking at a colonial colonized people. And everywhere you look in the world, you find people trying to break out of this relationship that was imposed on us through this. It has different manifestations, different iterations and things like that. And so this is the center of much of the crisis, it seems to us, that we, even if you look at the Russian Revolution, you look at Ukraine, Ukraine, the question in Ukraine uh, didn't just begin, the question of Russia, I mean, 1918, the United States, along with every colonial power, including Japan, invaded Russia after the 1917 revolution. And since that time, they have worked to isolate and do other kinds of things to contain Russia because of the influence that the anti-colonial movements around the world had when Russia refused, the Bolsheviks, refused to participate in this war that was designed to redivide the world among these, these capitalist colonial predators. So here you have the, this advent of, uh, of this country uh, that the Europeans assume should have been a part of their plunder of the rest of the world, and they break free from that, which means that objectively speaking, they have aligned themselves with the anti-colonial movement that's happening around the world, including Nicaragua at the time, uh, the Garvey movement with 11 million African people around the world participating in it, and other people who were fighting against colonial domination around the world. And that's what we've seen, you know, like uh, all that time. So. Here's where we see the beginning of this whole contradiction. We went to periods where we talked about NATO. NATO was created as an entity to contain and destroy the so Soviet Russia, as it was characterized at that time. It's not something that just got busy in 2014. It was always there. It always had that as an objective, right? And so uh, 
But one thing that was really important when we talk about Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, uh, et cetera, is that the United States uh, uh, did not have the ability to dominate the world uh, uh, as this unipolar world, it dumped force, this big hegemon that could disregard anything that it wanted to. Uh, and even the way it had to contend with Black people struggling in this country, people in, in, in other places around the world, it, it was in contention with a view and organization that was coming from, from, a, from another vantage point. Uh, in this instance, we're talking about Soviet Russia, as it was characterized, which was a power. It was not Afghanistan. <laughs> this was a power with nuclear weapons and all of those things uh, that they had to contend with. And so, uh, and now we have a situation where a certain deterioration, uh, despite the joy, the glee that we saw William Jefferson Clinton express uh, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the assumption that they would dominate the world henceforth, uh, uh, something we've seen an ongoing deterioration of the capacity, relative capacity of the United States uh, and all of the colonial powers, uh, the economic and other kinds of political crises they're involved in. And now uh, you have Russia and China representing this big force that they also have to contend with. And they have to contend with them in relationship to me, to you, uh, to Venezuela, to all the colonial powers in the world. It's not just they who can make all the rules by themselves, uh, uh, and this is a problem. Even in Africa, you have a situation <laughs> where uh, they couldn't, that usually these forces who function simply as neo-colonial puppets, tools who do, who would do whatever the United States says, uh, now they are refusing to unite with this narrative that's been created by the United States regarding uh, Ukraine. And a point that we would make in, 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 uh, is that uh, the, the, the war that we see happening there is a U.S. war against Russia that uses Ukraine as a, as a vehicle for making that war, that's killing Ukrainians, that's killing Russians, that even since 2014 up until 2014 up until uh, 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 January of, I think, February of last year, it killed something like 13,000, 13, 000, 13 uh, a uh, uh, thousand uh, 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 Russians uh, in Eastern Russia or, or in Eastern Ukraine. This is the, what we're looking at. And so our party has always, 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 always demanded total, absolute liberation, freedom for black people here and around the world in unity and solidarity with all the peoples of the world who are living under colonial domination. And we were there when, in, uh, when the United States, uh, I was in Nicaragua when the United States declared uh, with General Alexander Haig, who was the Secretary of State at that time, uh, who once brought into office, made the declaration that henceforth, that those who are fighting uh, for freedom or fighting uh, will not be characterized as freedom fighters, they will be characterized as terrorists. This is, became policy then. Nicaragua, El Salvador, you know, et cetera, engaged in, in these struggles and Cuba, and all of these things were, were really distracting, especially since it was happening in this hemisphere. And so they were going to be characterized as terrorists. That's, you can find Hague's, you know, uh, characterization that. And then they, they go around and they, they come up with a list of countries and, and, and groups that they are terrorists. And if you have any relationship with them, then somehow you are participating with terrorists. You know, So you can't have a relationship with any force that supports you in opposition to what the United States is doing or any force that, that, uh, uh, that, unite, that is fighting for its freedom that the United States has put on this list of terrorists. And as you know, the United States has come up now, as you just referenced, uh, with the determination that the world is not distinguished by communists and, and, and capitalists as such anymore, uh, not, on, not just like that, it's democracies and autocracies. And the United States is the chief of the democratic world. And, uh, and of course, anybody that's opposed to the United States that has different interests that's articulated and politicized is an autocrat. And in, in Venezuela's autocratic country, Nicaragua, Iran, uh, Russia, all of these, China, all of these are autocrats because they are trying to go in other directions. But how can you be this great democracy when every day you open a newspaper, you see another African being killed by the police department, uh, by white people, 
or, or, or colonizers, uh, uh, etc. How do you how do you become a democracy? How can you complain about this? Can you complain about this? No, we're not opposed to you having uh, the right for free speech. We're not opposed to you participating in the electoral process. What we are fighting you for is not that. We are fighting you because the Russians told you to do it. So you can attack me because we organized elections in St. Petersburg, Florida, 2017, 2019 that demanded reparations to black people, uh, that demanded an end to gentrification that is pushing out black people from the communities that we've lived in uh, since we've been here uh, in this country. Uh, you uh, say that it's the Russians who told us to do this, therefore we cannot do it. And so you can come in St. Petersburg, Florida, you can attack us with flashbang grenades in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, because the Russians told us to do something. Of course, it would be if you believe the Russians were such a force, you wouldn't attack St. Petersburg, Florida, you'd attack St. Petersburg, Russia. But to attack St. Petersburg, Russia offers different consequences than attacking St. Petersburg, Florida. Listen, they're doing the same thing they're trying to do with China. They're trying to pull China into a thing with Taiwan. They want the, they want to pump up the so-called Taiwanese government, right? Uh, they send Pelosi, they send this African uh, 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 neo-colonial forces, Gregory Meeks, they all rush to Taiwan. China has already made specific statements. They've changed the nature of the world. The world is defined according to them. Just like, uh, what's his name, uh, Guaidro? What's his name? Is now the president. They pick Guaido, Guaido, Guaido. He's already a uh, uh, dead know, politician. He's the president, because they said it, right? It has nothing to do with the aspirations and interests of the, of the Venezuelan. So anyway, they attacked us, and uh, uh, we have done, you mentioned some of the things we've done. We've done the same thing you've done. We've done the same thing that Hugo, uh, Hugo Chavez and Maduro, and you have attempted to do. We've done the same thing that any force that's fighting against colonialism has attempted to do, and that is to, to capture uh, to possession of our own, of the productive forces. And that is to produce for ourselves, to be able to liquidate or minimize the colonial intrusion into our communities. That's what Venezuela is about. It's taking over. That's what we are about. And we, this is part of the struggle against colonialism, and they can't tolerate that. They can't. And so that's the fundamental question. So they attacked us. And uh, we are an inspiration to people everywhere we are in our communities and other people as well. I want to mention that. You know, I mentioned Nicaragua, I was there. You know, I, I met uh, uh, Commandante uh, uh, Daniel Ortega. Uh, I was there. I see Nicaragua venció El Salvador. Since Nicaragua venció El Salvador, venció. I was there. You know, uh, and and uh, <laughs> Venezuela was different at that time because all the people who came uh, to that conference that I attended, uh, 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 you know, from Vietnam. Tremendous applause when the Vietnamese walked in to all the colonized people of the world, stood up and cheered them. And Venezuelans came in. The Venezuelans were the best dressed, most expensive forces in there because Venezuela was different. And that's what they want now. They want the Venezuela that existed then to exist now. And that's the struggle they've been having. So you know how much they respect elections by what they did uh, with Hugo Chavez, uh, who I'm convinced they killed. Like I'm also convinced they killed uh, 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 the Palestinian. Who am I thinking of? Uh, who? Gaddafi. Gaddafi. Yeah. yeah, sir, Arafat. Arafat, I'm convinced Thank they killed Arafat. Him, you know, yes. uh, 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 but anyway, that's another story. And I've taken up too much of your time with my initial uh, response, uh, Kompa Uhuru. But 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 chairman, uh, ha, ha, what is the status of the of the process? Uh, are they keep pushing it? Uh, is yes. the public opinion shifting their you I, know, I, energy? <laughs> we we the, the the they make the mistake in the 1960s. They were relatively successful. They were very successful. They crushed militarily uh, the struggle of African people in this country. They killed King. They killed Malcolm X. Uh, uh, they uh, destroyed the Black Panther Party. They assassinated people up and down. Fred Hampton, 1969, uh, the, the guy who was Attorney General uh, had declared that by the end of, uh, of, uh, of 1969, the Black Panther Party would be destroyed. And Fred Hampton, they thought, would be the, the end of that when they killed him December 4th, 1969. So all of that happened. Uh, but and as it was happening to us around the country, we were saying, we know this thing is coordinated. What is, what is going on? And, and others were characterizing us being paranoid. 
But this time when they have come, they have broadcast in the middle of the night and they have held press conferences and said, yes, we did it. This is the FBI did it. And we did it because we discovered that they're Russians in black skin or uh, something to that effect, right? And so, uh, so that's different. And it gives us the ability to have this discussion I'm having with you now and to talk to people all over who say the United States, who can recognize that the United States did this and we can work to help people understand better uh, what is going on. And it's happening at a time where the United States itself, the whole social fabric of this country is frayed to such an extent that now you have so-called right-wingers who are talking about the weaponization of the FBI. Hell, we could have told them 100 years ago the FBI was a weapon against the rights of the people, et cetera. Just the, the whole thing is frayed. So yeah, more and more people certainly uh, have demonstrated, since this happened, hundreds, thousands of people expressed support and solidarity with our party and our movement. And we're still working. We're still building communities, uh, even as this discussion is, is happening right now. Uh, I spoke uh, last night, I was attended a meeting last night that we were invited to, invited to through one of the programs that we have, where we're creating uh, women's uh, health centers uh, in the middle of this community, where we've created, uh, we had, uh, trained uh, African women uh, as what is characterized as doulas who can help uh, bring healthy babies uh, into existence. I'm talking about in St. Louis, North St. Louis, where a city where uh, uh, something like uh, enough black babies die in the first year of life to fill 15 kindergarten classes, you know? And so we are facilitating the ability of, of African women to have babies and their children and they uh, to be protected. So these are programs that we have going on all the time. We have not stopped despite, and guess what? When they attacked us, their assumption was to isolate us. More people are trying to join with us because they saw the attack and they say, we, we know what happened. And uh, I spoke, I was at a meeting last night. I've never been in such a, a affluent community in my life. I didn't even know. I mean, I've only seen this in movies and, and in the movies, it was only one, but I have a whole community, the most extraordinary uh, uh, living quarters, uh, rich, <laughs> very, very rich people. And we were there having this discussion about our programs and how they could support them. So the thing is that in various quarters, uh, uh, among various peoples uh, here and around the world, uh, we are, are winning stuff. But what has happened is the United States government, uh, we saw this morning, has put uh, on the United States State Department, it put on its Twitter feed, uh, and then also on its website, uh, a, a, a $10 million reward uh, for uh, any information about Alexander Ionov. Uh, the one who was supposed to be my handler, supposed to have been responsible for us working for the Russians, uh, for any information that has to do with them interfering in elections in this country. And clearly that's connected to what, where we are going. Uh, uh, on Wednesday, we participated in a meeting, uh, I think you referenced that earlier on, Compa, uh, uh, where we've taken to the St. Louis Board of Alder Person, which is the equivalent of city council for people who don't have these awards like that. And we've calling on them uh, to uh, pass a resolution uh, saying that they will not allow the city police to work with the FBI, you know, in attacking people working to uplift our communities like they worked in, in, in 1969 when they murdered uh, Fred Hampton and in other places around, around this country. So we expect, our lawyers have told us that we can expect an indictment any day, and we're surprised it has not happened yet. So we expect to be indicted. Uh, uh, and I think that they were surprised that we didn't simply surrender and, and shut up as lawyers would tell you to do, don't say anything. Uh, but we, there's no way that we're going to uh, be a, a crucified, lynched this political lynching that they're going to do uh, without letting the world know, hey, there's a lynching that's happening right now. And one of the most odious things that they have done, and I'm glad that, Kompa, that you uh, drew attention to this, is this racist trope that somehow Africans are supposed to be too stupid, too dumb to know that we're being oppressed and exploited. We're going to take somebody who they would consider white uh, and uh, to come and tell us that this is happening to you. This is just the most ridiculous asinine and we have no choice but to fight back. And so I'm glad that you are helping us to have this discussion to facilitate that because we believe that 
when you when you bring light to the subject and help people to know what the hell is going on, people can make better choices and and it makes it more difficult for this 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 autocratic entity that's the United States uh, to carry its will out without complications. Uhuru, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Joe, uh, it's your turn. This is a question for you. <laughs> Uh, please tell us about your experience as leader, as activist uh, of the movement opposing FBI repression, and what can be learned from that experience to avoid repetition of these intimidation practices, but also to secure legal victories. And I believe that is this is particularly important because I sure I'm surprised that that you haven't been yet indicted. Chairman, I, I I was thinking that after all that circus they uh, had after what like what these six months they have already uh, subpoenaed you or whatever, and and they haven't done that, and that's the weird thing about the U.S. democracy. Yeah. <laughs> So, we, we, we live in it, terror. You you don't know when they're going to come back at pre-dawn in the morning uh, with armored yes, vehicles and yes. and the military but, assault. You know, but I believe that the experience of the Compass in Chicago uh, might be illuminating because they had to suffer. You have to live a lot of things. Go, Joe, please jump in. Well, first of all, thank you, Jesus, and thanks to Orinoco Tribune for this invitation to join with. Uh, Chairman Yeshitela to talk about these terrible attacks. And I want to begin by expressing um, our, our, our total solidarity um, with the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru Movement, in your uh, righteous resistance um, and defending your rights as a, as a movement, as an organization uh, to, to campaign for Black liberation, um, and to uh, you know, seek aid and support from any quarters. All freedom struggles have the right to seek aid from any quarters. Um, I also want to say that uh, yeah, the raids against us in 2010 were an earlier uh, act, uh, you know, from you know a dozen years ago by the U.S. government attacking. Uh, uh, you know, organizations that, you know, were were engaged in popular struggle, as the Uhuru movement uh, and the APSP it, it are are currently. Um, I, I I wanted to uh, next address the, the the point that you raised, uh, Jesus, about what lessons uh, can activists draw from our experience and uh and i think this is i think there are there are three lessons here number one um i do not think that we can expect that the fbi is going to stop attacking the people's movements uh you know a a, a you know a, a an animal like that does not change this is what they were designed to do. This is what they were brought into existence to do. They are the political police. Um, and what, what we have to do is not um, hope or expect that they will cease this repressive behavior. What we have to do is, as a movement is we have to prepare ourselves for attacks. We have to do as uh the the chairman and uh, and the uhuru movement are doing which is to rally progressives to defend anyone attacked by the fbi um and to insist that opposing imperialism fighting for black liberation international solidarity with national liberation struggles abroad those are not crimes what the FBI is doing um, and what the Department of Justice, that, uh, that is criminal behavior. That is a, a, a violation of the rights of an organization that was engaged in political activity, um, uh, a, you know, a protected, uh, you know, protected activity, activity protected by the US Constitution. 
Um, so, so they're the criminals. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so that's number one. We have to, we have to expect this. Number two, anyone who is subject to the FBI raids or even just a visit by the FBI has to do what the Uhura movement has done, which is to speak up. They, the FBI, they're like cockroaches. And if they are exposed to the light, they will scatter. And so um, we, we, we hear this all the time, people who say, oh, well, I got an FBI visit. They'll call us and say, I got an FBI visit, but I don't want my employer to know, or I don't want my parents to know, or I don't want it to be in the press. And our answer to them always is the first step in fighting this repression is to bring it to light, to, to, to report it. And then um, you know, one last point from our, uh, from our experience, actually two last points from our experience, um, when the FBI comes to talk to you, don't talk to the FBI. <laughs> um, the, uh, if you'll notice in the, uh, in the scandals around the Trump administration, there's only been a few people who've gone to prison that were part of the Trump regime. All of them went to prison for lying to the FBI. It is a felony to lie to the FBI. So when they come to you and say, we just want to ask a few questions, say, number one, I'm not talking to you. Uh, the only thing I have to do is give you my license and prove that I live here or prove that I am who I am. Um, and second, say, I want to talk to my lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, call the National Lawyers Guild hotline. You can Google it and tell them that you're being questioned by the FBI and you need an attorney. Do not talk to the FBI. And there's a corollary. Do not talk to a grand jury. The grand jury is an anti-constitutional uh, body, which is, you know, there's a, an old expression about grand juries, which is a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. 99% of suspects who are brought in front of a grand jury, they bring back guilty. Uh, they bring back indictments against them, not guilty, but indictments against them. 99%. So that's how, by the way, for, for people who are engaged in the struggle against racist policing and against police terror, if you ever see, like in Louisville, where a district attorney failed to bring indictments against the cops that killed Breonna Taylor, or in, uh, or in, in Wisconsin, um, when uh, when you know when the cops were attacking protesters um, in Kenosha, and the grant and the district attorney could not bring an indictment, did not bring an indictment against those police officers. That's because they did not want an indictment of those police officers. So uh, it is incumbent upon everyone in the movement to understand that. Talking to a grand jury um, is doing the work that, that the government needs in order to harm our resistance. The final lesson from, from our movement, we were a group of activists, we, as, as Jesus said, um, that, that we were involved in anti-war organizing, broadly speaking. But we weren't just against the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war, which by the year 2010 had become unpopular. The majority of people in the United States had turned against those wars. It was on the basis of opposition to those wars, one of the bases of one of the campaign programs of Barack Obama was he campaigned against those wars. You, you'll remember too that Donald Trump campaigned against the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and the war in Syria. Those wars are unpopular among the American people. What we did was not just oppose those wars, we oppose all. 
the United States wars and went a step further and expressed our solidarity with the, the, the heroic people of Colombia and Palestine in their resistance to um, imperialism and in the case of the Palestinians, their resistance to the settler colony uh, that uh, is called Israel. And, um, and when we were raided, uh, you know, we Im immediately responded and said, not only, not only are we, did we do nothing wrong, but opposing war is not a crime and international solidarity is not a crime. And there were many of our friends in the peace movement who also suggested to us, well, you know, yes, defend your anti-war activity, but you really shouldn't talk about um, the right of the people of Palestine and the people of Colombia to resist by any means necessary. And we had to be very clear on that, that, that when, when people are occupied, resistance is justified. And, and, and that's one of the key slogans that, that, we, that we raised. And, and, when, <clears throat> uh, and when we were threatened, the, the assistant US attorney, we never talked, none of us who were, there were eventually 23 of us who were subpoenaed. None of us talked to uh, the grand jury or to the U assistant US attorneys, but they talked to our attorneys and they told our attorneys they said we have enough to indict your clients to put them on trial and convict them uh, of the of the crime of providing material support to foreign terrorist organizations and 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 if your client refuses to appear before our grand jury we will bring we will get a judge to bring civil contempt or even criminal contempt of court um, uh, uh, against them, and they will face 18 months in prison simply for refusing to talk to the grand jury. So all of us, by the way, who, who were subpoenaed, the, of, of the people who were subpoenaed, there were three families in which both um, uh, you know, mom and dad, or mom and mom, in in uh, in, uh, uh, in one of the families, uh, we had to take out for our kids who were who were not um, of legal age. We had to have friends and comrades complete the paperwork to be temporary to have temporary custody over our kids um, because we said we will never talk to your grand jury because what would i face as you know as an american i might face 18 months in prison but what they wanted us to tell them they wanted us to tell them who we know in palestine and who we work with who we know in colombia and who we work with and here you know for us i mean they did they did bring weapons when they raided our homes and in in the case of you know, one of the homes, Mick Kelly, who's the editor of Fightback, um, they and the political uh, secretary of Freedom Road, they they busted uh, him and his wife. They busted their door down with a sledgehammer and uh, with a battering ram and came in with their automatic weapons drawn. Um, not as extreme as the assaults on you, comrade uh, Yeshitella, but 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 you know, they they there was there was an armed component. There was a violent component of the raids against us. But, you know, if, if we had been indicted, you know, for, if, if we had gotten the charge of, you know, refusing to testify, if we'd gotten a criminal contempt, uh, you know, conviction, um, you know, facing 18 months in prison, but in Palestine, if, if the Israelis got evidence from us about who we were working with, well, those comrades would be, tortured or killed and the same is true in Colombia and we and we said that we're you know we will never tell you you know who we're working with we aren't telling you anything so so we had to balance you know like number one 
the discipline of a movement that refuses to cooperate with those criminal proceedings, those repressive proceedings. And number two, we had to appeal as uh, the Uhura movement is doing today for solidarity, for every right thinking part of our society to, to recognize and stand with, uh, with you know, the, the forces that are actually fighting for, for liberation and for rights in this country. So just once again, I, I wanna express uh, on behalf of Freedom Road Socialist Organization and the Committee to Stop FBI Repression, I want to express our unconditional solidarity with, with uh, uh, Chairman Yeshitela and all of your comrades. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Great, great, great information you're providing. I believe that that's the importance of, you know, connecting each other and learning from the past, from history. And, and and one question, just final question. So the, the judicial process against you is officially closed or not? Because I know that sometimes those things are never closed, right? Uh, it's, it's not been closed to our knowledge. Uh, they never sent us a memo saying, um, you're free to go. They just stopped pursuing us. Of course, they, you know, even after the, the grand jury dates, um, they, they, you know, if, if, you know, comrades will remember in the spring of 2011, they uh, raided and arrest, they raided the home at, you know, and kicked in the door of, of our comrade, uh, Carlos Montes, one of the founders of the Brown Berets, um, and, you know, stuck a, stuck a machine gun in his face and charged him with an absurd charge linked to a protest in 1970 against Ronald Reagan. It was just bizarre <laughs> how they dug that up. Um, and then most seriously, two years after that, they raided and arrested our, our dear comrade, Rasmia Oda, and put her on trial, put her just through the most horrible trials where she had to relive the torture and rape that she suffered at the hands of the Israeli jailers from 1969. And, uh, and, and we, we beat them. She beat them in court. And then Donald Trump got elected. And he said, essentially, uh, I don't care if they won in court, we're going to deport her anyway. And so she took a plea deal to avoid having to go through another trial because they, you know, the US government decided to try her again on, on even greater charges. And so she's She's now living in Jordan, but but after she was deported in 2017, we haven't heard a thing. So please send send her uh, uh, a big hug from me if you talk to her. I, I will. I uh, she will be so happy to hear that, Jesus. Please. I will send it to her uh, right after the right after this meeting. Listen, listen, guys. Uh, let's jump to the third question, and it is for both of you. Um, this is it. What can be done to strengthen the socialist and anti-imperialist movement in the U.S.? Why was the response to the Tyle Nichols assassination so stale, so weak? Uh, Chairman, if you want to jump in first, feel okay. free or Joe. <clears throat> Thank you. I really believe that uh, one of the fundamental contradictions that uh, that we experience in the United States is this whole question of colonialism and the colonial mode of production that uh, uh, challenges uh, an assumption by uh, most of the, of the white people uh, in this country uh, that, that there is some kind of equal framework that we all uh, have uh, to, uh, 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 to you know, to work with in this country that, you know, that commonly we hear uh, when something is happening uh, to the African community, even with the Tyree Nichols, for example, uh, well, they must have done something wrong uh, because uh, what is characterized as the dictatorship or the bourgeoisie by many Marxists uh, 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 is uh, it's called uh, invisible or in many instances because people can vote most times and, and do uh, things like that, but it's always visible to the colonized. Uh, 
It's always visible. There's no such thing as freedom of speech. I mean, it, there's no such thing as freedom of assembly. Nothing like that. When the cop comes up, and that's the closest association that most Black people have with the government is the police. When the cop comes up in the community and says, get off the corner, uh, the ability to assemble there uh, and to even talk back to the cop you know, uh, is immediately uh, something that's dismissed with violence in many instances, jails, and sometimes death. This is the reality, you know, that we live with. And so this colonial question, because uh, there are uh, two systems that's at work at the same time. There is some presumption anyway of uh, democracy, presumption of democracy, whether, you know, you can say, well, it was violated, I didn't get it here or there, but there is no presumption, generally speaking, of democracy for black people, which is why they can kill it. Which is why a cop would have the audacity to put his knee down on the neck of George Floyd and, 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 and grin while doing it, which is why uh, grand jurors will not indict. You know, you talk about that, that ham sandwich that, uh, that the grand jury uh, will indict. <clears throat> well, if you go back to the language of the 1960s and recognize that we're dealing with pigs, and this is the instance, the, the 1%, that pig, <laughs> that ham sandwich will not be indicted by the grand jury because that doesn't happen for colonized people. ICE, special police uh, for, for Mexican people uh, at the borders and what have you. There's, there's, no, there's no democracy there. If this was happening to white people, there'd be an uproar, uprage. And not only that, it would be reported on a regular basis in the media, but you don't hear that. You don't hear reporting of what's happening to the Mexicans, what's happening to indigenous people. You can't read that. And when you do hear it, it's by somebody who's working for the Russians, you see. So it can be dismissed, uh, that kind of thing. That's the kind of reality. I think the colonial question. And when we talk about racism, we have concluded that racism is simply the ideological foundation of colonialism, of a colonial capitalist system. It's the ideological foundation of the colonial capitalist system. It is something that unites uh, the broad uh, population, a uh, white population in this country uh, in, with the colonial domination and, and, uh, of, of, of Africans and other people. But I do agree. I want to say that that's being, that's being chipped away. That's being dealt with in a very serious way. I mean, we have an organization, a part of our party uh, is called the African People's Solidarity Committee as a solidarity movement is characterized. Their work is essentially in among the colonizers in the white community and sometimes referred to as behind enemy lines uh, so that uh, they exist in 141 cities in this country. Uh, so uh, it's not when they that's why when they attack me, my home in North St. Louis, which is majority black, they couldn't just do that. They had to go to South St. Louis where the white people live, attack the homes and headquarters over there as well. Che Guevara once said that Solidarity is about more than simply well-wishing, but it is sharing the same fate, whether in victory or in death. And that's what has to happen, that the, those leftists, anti-imperialists, et cetera, have to be able to recognize the colonial struggle and manifestation, even as it exists inside the United States, inside these borders uh, by settlers, and say that something special and different is happening to Mexicans, that's happening to Black people, that's happening on these concentration camps that they call reservations. And those people have a right to define their own reality and fight for their own freedom. And we have a responsibility because if we are interested in socialism, we recognize that what Marx says, that the foundation, that the he said that, that the, the so-called, what he, what he referred to as wage slavery in Europe, required as a pedestal, slavery pure and simple in the new world. And that new world that he was talking about was carved out by black people, but carved out in place at Nicaragua, throughout the Americas, et cetera. And this is the foundation for the system. And they must unite with that understanding and help to work to overturn that relationship. And that's the struggle. I think that's the thing that's gonna really grow solidarity. And we see that amazing uh, relationship is surprising to me. Right now, I mean, we've seen a lot of stuff as, as Comrade Joe just said, in terms of people who are expressing solidarity uh, with the party, with the rural movement uh, uh, since this attack. Uh, we see a lot of that. And we've seen some particular uh, organizations, even the Green Party right here uh, in St. Louis, who've been on the front lines with us, who 
pursued to, you know, uh, like uh, this anti FBI and, and unite with the, with the party and the black community here. So a lot of that stuff is beginning to happen. And like I said, we exist with, these are white people in 141 cities in the United States who are working for reparations, who take black power struggle in the white community so that now they don't just can't come and kill us uh, like they did in Chicago and West Monroe in 1969. They have to take it to other circles uh, inside this country where white people live as well. And this is one of the things I think that will make a difference. And this is something that I'm hoping that, uh, that you know, can, we can see. We've always worked a big mountain in Arizona when they were threatening to kill uh, and, and destroy uh, the, the, the people uh, uh, right to the so-called Navajo there. Uh, they, they had discovered uranium, they're gonna take that. I was there on the front lines with them. I organized the first mass organization, mass movement in Northern California in solidarity with the struggle of Nicaragua. I organized the first mobilization uh, uh, after the Iranians took that nest of spies in 1979. We were on the front lines with demonstrations where, where uh, college students, white college students were having rallies at night saying, send the Klan to Iran, saying stuff like sand niggers go home. We organized those demonstrations and were met by flag waving Americans who attacked us physically and things like that. We organized the first demonstration, national demonstration against a jump, against, uh, against uh, Obama. We did that uh, 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 when nobody else and most of the white left were afraid to do it because they thought they would offend black people if they did it. We took it on and uh, uh, et cetera and criticized him. And when they were locking up Arabs and Muslims in this country and not giving them trials and stuff. We led the struggle of uh, calling for their liberation, et cetera. We've been on the front lines. That's the kind of solidarity we need to expect from everybody. We did this before we knew El Salvador and we were in solidarity. Before we knew Iranians, we were, and personally, we were in solidarity and demonstrate that solidarity. So, uh, because we recognize that this was uh, an offensive against the whole a social system. And that's the thing I think that's really important. We need to see that kind of dramatic support uh, when it's really important. The Palestinian question. Uh, this is something that people wouldn't touch with, a, with you know, like uh, they were so afraid of. You can't say anything. Yes. Yeah. Free, free Palestine. Long live Palestine. And we were opposed to this, this occupied Palestine that they renamed Israel, you know, which is nothing but a settler state. So We've been on the front line of all these questions and, and we think that's the thing that breaks down the doors and the barriers into the consciousness of ordinary people who are not activists and uh, gives them the ability to see something. Because if we don't challenge it, if those of us who, who so, so characterize ourselves as vanguard, don't give them a, 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 an alternative, then the only thing they're stuck with is a Biden and, and a, a Democratic Party and even a Bernie Sanders, who uh, had his version of socialism uh, was a Walmart wage over a number of years of $15 an hour. I mean, this is, you know, this, we have to challenge it and we have to do it publicly and we have to go up against the odds because they, this is the only way that people will have an opportunity to make a distinction when what, what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is bad? Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Joe, solidarity, but what else? Well, I just want to say about the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the, the murder of Tyree Nichols. Um, you know, first of all, I'm, I, uh, it was just so hor it was so horrible to, to have to watch that, to watch another black man being lynched by by cops um but i had to watch it um and and i, I first want to say that uh, the you know the chicago alliance against racist and political repression and the national alliance under the leadership of our executive director frank chapman we did have protests i mean they weren't big because you know here in chicago it was zero out but you know we had 300 hardy souls who came out um, after work on uh, the Monday after Tyree was killed. Um, but what's, what is interesting about the, the uh, reaction in public opinion uh, to, the, to that, to that um, horrendous killing, after the George Floyd rebellion, you know, the, the, the ruling class and, and, and their media they moved as quickly as possible 
because you know for for a couple of months after the rebellion all of the media all of the politicians even some of the republicans were talking about you know that that black people had been denied justice and something had to be done uh you know to address uh you know these this terrible scourge of 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 uh, i mean the the republicans never called it racist policing but many of the democrats did and all of the press did i mean not fox news but you know the majority of the press did but within a couple of months um as you know covid the covid economy got worse and then you know economic crimes began to as they always do uh in you know in periods of economic crisis began to surge in around the country um the media and the politicians pivoted to just ha you know hammering on you know law and order you know uh, both trump and biden you know used law and order language in their election campaign in the fall of 2020 um and ever since that's been the language i mean that's what happened in new york with the election of eric adams and right now, um, the, the mayoral election is happening in Chicago on February 28th. And up until, you know, the video and the public reaction, the, you know, the revulsion um, from, you know, a lot of the public at, at, the, at that just heinous lynching, um, finally, in the most recent debates, the mayoral candidates have begun talking about justice again. And here in Chicago, that manifested itself in a particular way because under Frank Chapman's leadership, after the George Floyd rebellion, we were able to amass, um, we were able to take those conditions and pass through the city council legislation that's creating a new elected council in every one of the police districts in Chicago for citizens, civilians, to have a role in determining who polices in their communities and how their communities are policed. So in Black communities, Black community control of the police. In Chicano communities, you know, Chicano and Mexicano control of the police in Puerto Rican communities, you know, Puerto Rican control of the police. Um, and the elections are on the same ballot. And, and, you know, the mayor had to sign off on this. Lightfoot had to sign off on this. And in some of her speeches, she actually claims credit for it, which is a lie. But, um, but, the, but none of the candidates with the exception of Brandon Johnson were talking about this. Brandon Johnson is the candidate put forward from the Chicago Teachers Union. None of the candidates were talking about these district council elections. But after the outrage, it didn't express itself in protest, but it did express itself, you know, from pulpits and in, you know, and from, you know, media in the black community, from progressive, you know, white and other organizations. Um, that you know the finally the debates for mayor started talking about justice and many of them are now talking about oh well this election on february 28th this is going to be you know a, a way to address uh you know this this uh, this scourge this problem so so we we have seen that the debate has shifted back again but but you know of course the public opinion is you know, is subject to the class struggle and, and the ruling class is, you know, is gonna come back in Chicago and they'll, they'll have another, you know, a, a assault on, uh, you know, for law and order. But after February 28th, we're going to have initial organization in every police district. And we have some real power with this because the commission, those elected counselors get to select a, members of a commission who get to rewrite the seat, the Chicago Police Department rule book. So this is gonna be some real power. Is it community control of the police as a whole? It's not, it's, it's a step in that direction. 
but it's it's a it, it's it's an important outcome. It was won as a result of the George Floyd rebellion. I'll just say that. So it's it's a, it is it is possible to win victories, and I believe there's going to be a victory in the defense campaign for the Uhuru movement and the African People's Socialist Party. Once again, when we fight, we win. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I want to really salute that, uh, uh, what uh, Komenyado Joe uh, just said. I mean, um, he's actually articulated uh, a position that we've had around a Black community control of police. And uh, also, we've, uh, in 1984, we did something similar around uh, land control uh, throughout Oakland, California. We put it on the ballot uh, where uh, there's, it was the whole process of driving people out of the homes and whatever had escalated to a really critical point. And uh, people had an opportunity to vote uh, and, and create uh, uh, districts, uh, uh, com black community control of housing districts, a uh, community control of housing districts throughout out Oakland which would allow the Mexican community, African community, other communities based on income and what have you within a certain geographical uh, territory, uh, uh, put it on the ballot, fought, got it on the ballot, won something like 20% of the vote, went up against all the realtors and up against, uh, at this time, this guy, uh, Duke Majin was the governor and a newspaper uh, uh, article came out saying that uh, if this measure, said this is not land, uh, this is not, uh, uh, what did they call it, rent control. This is rent revolution said, if this measure passes on, on Tuesday, that Governor Duke Majin would order an airstrike on Oakland on Wednesday. So that's how, how critical the, 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 the ruling uh, class saw uh, this kind of work. And I think it's really important because uh, you, you mentioned that this was not quote unquote protest, but I think that I think uh, different forces make a mistake when they only understand uh, making these struggles in the form of protests like that, that there are ways that we involve masses of people in advancing their political interests. Sometimes they don't call themselves socialists or militants, et cetera, but when we can put their interests before them and give them an opportunity to advance it, they can be socialist interests, they can be militant interests, they can, et cetera, et cetera, then people will take that opportunity if they have an if they can. So I think that's that's uh, really important. And I also want to say that uh, when you look at the George Floyd thing on May 25th uh, is when he was murdered, and I remember that because that's African Liberation Day. Uh, and on May 26th is when we saw these extraordinary uprisings all over uh, all over the the United States and also in various other countries. People uh, moved in solidarity uh, with African people uh, uh, around that. And so it was uh, it, it's it's a volatile situation. The colonial question is extraordinarily volatile, and if people can get their brains around it and escape from this framework that's been imposed on us, especially the racial framework. Uh, because the fact is that we're looking at colonialism. If they can have us fighting against racism, we can't see the way forward because racism is simply a, a, an artifact. It's something that was created to, for the purpose of uh, uh, confusing people. And you look at, uh, like the, we mentioned uh, this, this brother, um, uh, 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 who was the brother we were talking about, just killed, uh, 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 the, the Africans were the cops who killed him. Right, who Tyree Nichols? Killed. Yeah, and yes. and they said, "Wow!" Right away, right away, it didn't take any moment before they said, "These guys are going to uh, going to be charged with murder and other kinds of things, etc." And uh, one reason it was easy to do that is because this racial trope. Because uh, up until now, when the cops killed somebody, it was the white cops. It was racism. It's because they were white and we were black. And they don't understand the nature of the state. And the state works in the interest of the existing social system for protect it and to advance it. So if you look at Vietnam, when the French fought against the, the colonized Vietnamese people, 71% of the troops who fought for France against colonial people were colonized themselves. And when America fought against the Vietnamese, 50 to 64% of the frontline troops against the people, colonized people in Vietnam, but colonized Africans from this country. So people get confused around this question, don't understand the nature of the state or what the state is, that there is such a thing called a state unless it's Georgia. 
and don't understand, you know, things, you know, uh, like this racial thing, it traps people, locks their brain in some subjective place. And we don't need subjectivism to solve this problem. We need an objective view of what makes this world function. And colonialism is a thing that all of it sits on. So once you can come to grips with the colonial question, I think we're a step closer uh, to being able to be victorious in this struggle. Thank you for your Science. answer, Compass. You know, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your answers. Solidarity. Not only Same protest way. is is also part of the answers, you know? Yes. And, and, and that's important also. And racism that is behind everything, yes. at least behind everything that happened in the global north. The yes. last question, Chairman. Uh, why do you think they targeted you? What think, do you see for the future of the international, you know, anti-colonial socialist struggle? That's my last question. And in uh, 2019, um, Oxford uh, University, the uh, uh, Oxford Union invited me to speak at Oxford University, which is the premier uh, 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 institution for bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, intellectuals or intellectualism. They had invited Malcolm X there too. And I think they invited me because they saw something was changing in this country that just running around saying black, black whining, that black lives matter, uh, didn't take us anywhere. It didn't even criticize the social system in any, any significant way. So they saw the work we were doing and they invited me based on that. And I think one of the reasons they invited me uh, is the same reason they invited Malcolm at a time where the civil rights movement itself had run into this crossroads about where it was going to go. And Malcolm X was the guy who had split from the nation of Islam and was trying to take it to a whole different place. And I think they saw that with us. And I think that's part of what the United States government has seen in us, that we don't exist uh, just in the United States. We're a small organization. Make no mistake about it. I'm not talking about some grandiose, um, huge organization. We're not, uh, and, and we're limited in so many ways. But the thing is that we exist in the United States. We exist in the Caribbean. We exist all over Europe and European uh, states. Um, uh, and I'm talking about Africans now. And uh, we exist uh, all over Africa. We have a, a, a really impressive organized presence in South Africa, uh, in various other places in Africa. So, and, and central to much of the United States movement today is Africa, which is why they just for the first 246 year history of the Marine Corps, uh, they, they put a black man as a four-star general, first time in, in 246 years. And then what did they do with him? They put him in charge of Africa. Uh, this uh, military entity with the responsibility of controlling Africa and against from Africans and then from whom else? From China and Russia. That intervention is what it was about. First time in history, uh, a, a, an African was made head of what they call the Department of Defense. Uh, that's no accident. This is a statement about where they're trying to go. And also uh, this whole notion of, of racism and you have to be black to be able uh, a white, you know, to commit these atrocities when you, uh, you you function as an instrument of state power, colonial state power. So I think that's, uh, I think that's revealing and, and really important. And uh, I think that's part of the fact that we're in these places. And of course, this issue of Ukraine, this, this bloody, nasty, brutal war, and that, that Zelensky and, and, uh, and, 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 and others are participating in that's leading to the death and destruction of uh, people in Ukraine and people in Russia and what have you. And then people who have no understanding of the whole history, not just going back to a hundred and so years ago, but even more recent, recently. And, and the, 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 the fascist component, and I don't even want to go to fascism because that's not necessarily a question because uh, Biden is not a part of the fascist component. The thing is colonial domination. And uh, so I think that uh, our, our out of the box, a day before uh, the Russia operation began in Ukraine, uh, I was making presentations about what this whole thing was about. I mean, it's got a video that somebody just brought to my attention about how we were 
defining and characterizing what was happening with the United States attack on Russia through this thing. And that's been what we've been pushing all along. I think that's uh, a problem. And I think there are other people, not just we are doing this, but other people are doing this. And I think that it makes a statement about the possibility of the African population. We work very closely uh, with Mexican National Liberation Movement in this country uh, uh, and various others. So I think those are some of the reasons and uh, the fact that we've got a certain kind of traction that makes it prob uh, problematic. And you may remember in 1969, the head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the domestic US political police in this country declared that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of this country. Not the Russians, you know, not some other bad actors, but the Black people, and that they created a counterintelligence program that was designed to crush uh, uh, any Black uh, movement that's doing the kinds of things that we do now. It was in that context that we saw Malcolm kill, Martin Luther King kill, Fred Hampton in Chicago kill, more than 30 members of the Black Panther Party assassinated, murdered throughout this country, hundreds who were thrown into prison uh, and hundreds who, who were not members of the Black Panther Party that, that therefore didn't uh, have the same kind of connections and notoriety throughout this country who were in prison, that kind of thing. And so now I think they see uh, a reemergence of a, a, a particular a kind of trajectory uh, within the African liberation movement, and they see us at the forefront of that. And I think that's one of the reasons that they attacked, along with you know the whole convergence of the perfect storm, if you will, a perfect sort of anti-imperialist storm that's brewing throughout the world, that's fracturing even you know the the solidarity of U.S. society itself that sees you know white people scaling the walls of the U.S. Congress, defecating on the on the desk and you know, all of this stuff happening. This is a very difficult spot for them to be in. And they would scapegoat Black people if they can't <laughs> scapegoat me, African People's Socialist Party, and anybody else who criticizes them. So, I mean, that's part of what I would say, comrade. And, and I, the, a really important thing that I've left out is the fact that we have really involved a, white people, I mean, there are thousands, literally thousands of white people who are influenced by our movement directly, you know, uh, in various institutions and institutionalized processes we've created, and in the organization of the African People's Solidarity Committee and Uhuru Solidarity Movement, there are thousands. And so I think that's also a problem, you know, for them. Uh, usually they've been able to, I, they could kill Malcolm and there was not gonna be any demonstration from the white community. They can kill uh, uh, even Mal Martin Luther King. You didn't have massive uprisings, you know, from white people. Uh, Fred Hampton, no, you didn't see that. But uh, we built a movement now that makes it difficult for them to isolate the struggle of black people in the fashion they were able to do uh, in the 1960s. And so I think that's one of the things that makes uh, make us a problem as well. Uhuru. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you a lot to both of you, Compass, for your time. I'm really impressed and happy for the outcome of this interview. Um, I only, just to finish, want to, before asking you to say a final words, uh, I just wanna say that Orinoco Tribune is proud to have you. Um, and I want to invite anyone that is watching this interview to support the Uhuru movement the African People's Socialist Party to support the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, to support the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, and of course to support us in Orinoco Tribune <laughs> and subscribe to our YouTube channel that I'm we are trying to, you know, to promote lately. And thank you again, Compa. It was an honor to have you here. And feel free to say your final words. Un abrazo from Caracas. Adelante siempre. <laughs> Uhuru. Go to handsoffuhuru.org. Handsoffuhuru.org. Thank you so much. Uhuru. Great. Good to meet you, Joe. Again. Good, 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 to, good to see you again. <laughs> Once every 10 years. Yeah. Let's make it, let's make it more frequent. Marriages last if you can make that kind of thing happen, <laughs> <laughs> arrangement. Yeah. You know, uh, 
you, you, you don't. Uh, so I, I got divorced in the last eight years. So don't take my advice about making marriages <laughs> last. You're the expert on that, comrade. Uh, I also want to just push. This is not a book that I wrote, but uh, but um, Mike German, who's a former FBI agent, published this. Actually, this was in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, for people who want to learn more about the the techniques that uh, that the the FBI uses. Uh, it's this is a study. Mike German is a guy who was a counterterrorism um, agent with the FBI, and then when 9/11 happened, and he saw, you know, the you know the abuse that the FBI was carrying out, he left them and he went to work, you know, to become, you know, like to help contribute to movements that, you know, defending our rights, defending the Constitution, and you know, working working against war. So. Um, there's a there's a section in there that he interviewed me and and some other comrades who had been part of the, the you know who were raided back in 2010. But uh, you know I, uh, I I think it would be helpful for people who who want to dive in more deeply just on the particular questions of how the FBI and the Department of Justice work. And thank, thank you, you again, Jesus. And we'll you know nice give day. give give my love to your family and. Uh, and I will pass on your uh, your greetings to Rasmia Oda. You too, compas. Un abrazo. Pensaremos.